For thousands of years, people walked to the earth believing the grounds they stood on was flat. Once every few years, an event occurred which gave these people the first clue they needed to question this belief. This event was the Earth's shadow cast on the face of the moon, which we now call a lunar eclipse. Any one of these people could have devised a series of experiments, given a set of carefully reasoned arguments, and changed their opinion. But they didn't. This raises the question of how billions of people spread over thousands of years could remain ignorant of a fact which is at least theoretically within the grasp of their reason. Fully answering this question gets to the heart of what it means to be human, and may even hint at answers to some of the deepest unsolved questions of the universe. But before we get to the main point, let's take 30 seconds to examine why people first came to believe the Earth is flat. Well, the answer is obvious, really. From the perspective of someone on the ground, the Earth looks flat. Really flat. Knowing as we now do the exact dimensions of the Earth, we can see just how flat it looks. If you and a friend were to stand one kilometer apart from each other, on average, the curvature of the Earth is eight centimeters. Yes, eight centimeters. Our senses are simply not accurate enough to detect this minute change. So yeah, our senses are limited and mislead our intuition. But still, even using only our limited senses, figuring out the correct shape of the Earth is still possible. We know this because the ancient Greeks figured it out, sometime around 500 BC, using reasons and observations available to people for as long as we've existed. It turns out there's a bigger obstacle in the way, one which has delayed scientific progress for as long as humans have been around, but one which we are starting to comprehend and overcome. To understand it, let's first back up and think about two cavemen living 10,000 years ago. Okay, bear with me here. Mike and Nimai are brothers living in the same tribe. They are identical in every respect other than one. Mike is far weaker than Nimai, who is incredibly strong. Here's the question. Which of these brothers stands a better chance of surviving and reproducing to pass on their genetic information? The more obvious answer is Nimai. He's stronger and therefore better able to build things and win fights. But if we take a step back, what if the tribe lives in an area with a large population of lion? Maybe Nimai has the strength needed to win fights, but due to his excessive muscles, lacks the stamina needed to run away from the lions, which isn't a problem for Mike. Maybe the optimum strength is something like, just strong enough to win fights, but nimble enough to run away from lions. After all, if we blindly assume that stronger is always better, why hasn't evolution iterated the strength of men to the point that the average man is now as strong as a gorilla or the Incredible Hulk? With this in mind, let's now consider two more cavemen brothers living 10,000 years ago. First, we have Skeptical Stan. Stan is, as his name suggests, skeptical and logical. He spends his time examining evidence and thinking critically before coming to conclusions. He's the kind of person who would spend a considerable amount of time thinking about the true shape of the Earth. By contrast, we have Stan's brother, Instinctive Ian. Ian is, as his name suggests, instinctive and impulsive. He spends little to no time thinking critically. Instead, he relies on instinct and intuition to guide his actions. He develops rule of thumb responses to situations which he applies quickly and without examination. Ian would never dream of spending any time thinking about the shape of the Earth. It's flat, obviously. Similar to the previous question, which of these brothers stands a better chance of surviving and reproducing to pass on their genetic information? Like with Mike and Nimai, we can think of situations which will benefit each brother. Skeptical Stan has the clear advantage of being able to examine the tools and structures he builds, learn from his mistakes, and improve over time. However, if the brothers are out taking a leisurely stroll and see movement in a nearby bush, Instinctive Ian would be running away before Skeptical Stan can think to himself, I wonder what's moving in those bushes. Nine times out of ten, the movements would be a gust of wind or a falling branch. However, on the one occasion the movement turns out to be a lion. Well, Stan's not going to be building a rocket ship anytime soon. In the example with Mike and Nimai, the option of being more or less strong is fixed. For example, it wouldn't be possible to create a third brother who has Nimai's muscles 90% of the time, but can suddenly switch to Mike's agility 10% of the time. That said, thinking again about Skeptical Stan and Instinctive Ian, it is possible to imagine a third brother who uses the instinctive action of Ian for living his day-to-day -day life but who can switch to the skeptical, logical thoughts of Stan when appropriate. Let's call the brother Peter. Recent studies in psychology show that evolution found and applied this brilliant compromise to all of us. 
In the seminal book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman outlines his work with Amos Tversky researching this phenomenon, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. In summary, Kahneman divides our thought processes into two categories, called System 1 and System 2. System 1 is easiest understood as our brain's autopilot. It's the fast, automatic and unconscious system which we use to complete routine tasks such as recognizing faces, recalling the capital city of France, and walking. It's the system which Instinctive Ian uses to guide all of his actions and opinions. On the other hand, System 2 is our slow, effortful and conscious system, which we use to complete tasks which require our focus and attention, such as solving multiplication problems, memorizing a phone number, and learning to play a new instrument. It's the system which Skeptical Stan uses to guide his actions and opinions. Throughout the book, Kahneman gives example after example demonstrating a worrying result. We default to using System 1 in many situations which really should require us using System 2. Two shortcomings Kahneman discusses are the well-known confirmation bias fallacy and what he calls the what you see is all there is fallacy, both of which are illustrated in Peter Wasson's 246 experiment. In the experiment, Wasson told participants he was thinking of a rule which applies to sequences of three numbers. He then told the participants that the sequence 2, 4, 6 satisfies the rule. The participants were then challenged to find the rule. To do this, they were allowed to propose new sequences of numbers for which they would be told if the sequence satisfies the rule or if it did not satisfy the rule. They were allowed to propose as many new sequences as they liked before having one chance to guess at the rule at the end of the experiment. The majority of participants noticed the pattern of starting at some number and adding two each time, and suspected this to be the rule. They then proposed sequences which followed this rule. After all their guesses were confirmed to fit the rule, they were satisfied that they had seen enough information to confirm their initial guess and confidently asserted it to be the rule. Which is wrong. In other words, most of us approach the problem the same way Instinctive Ian would approach the problem by using the instinctive intuitive system one part of our brain. There's a fatal problem with this approach. Let's stop for a moment to think about how skeptical Stan may have approached the problem. First of all, Stan would certainly have taken advantage of being allowed to propose as many sequences as he likes before guessing the rule. Like most of us, Stan would have spotted the obvious pattern of adding two each time, and would probably propose a few sequences to see if this result holds. However, Unlike most of us, after this, Stan would use his skeptical mind to ask about sequences which he thought wouldn't fit the rule he had in mind. In other words, Stan would actively seek to disprove his existing theory. He would then adjust his theory as he gathered new evidence. If a theory survived all his attempts to disprove it, he would be more confident about its validity than if he'd only asked about sequences which he thought would fit the theory. It really is difficult to exaggerate the difference between these two approaches. Arguably, the most fundamental value at the core of modern science is the unrelenting attempt to disprove one's existing beliefs and opinions. To quote René Descartes, If you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life you doubt, as far as possible, all things. To quote Sherlock Holmes, there is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. Or to quote Lord Byron, I deny nothing but doubt everything. Opinions are made to be changed, or how else is the truth to be got at? Contrast this thinking to every other system of deriving knowledge, and we see the difference between a quack doctor doing more damage to his patients than good, and surgeons quite literally replacing someone's heart. But then why? Why do we default to using the instinctive intuitive system 1 part of our brain instead of the skeptical logical system 2 part? It doesn't seem to make any sense. Let's rewind to the question asked at the start of the video. When talking about the shape of the earth, we asked how it's possible that billions of people remained ignorant of the true shape of the earth. Let's think about this from the perspectives of our three cavemen, Skeptical Stan, Instinctive Ian, and Peter. While observing the eclipse, Stan would realize that the event was caused by the Earth casting a shadow on the moon. He would then question which shapes could consistently produce the shadow he observed. The answer? Only one. A sphere. Excited with his new idea, he would run to tell instinctive Ian and Peter. Ian of course rejects the idea outright. He's incapable of doubting his first impressions. 
But what about Peter? If we say that Peter is, by definition, the caveman who, from the evolutionary perspective of surviving and reproducing, perfectly balances using his instinctive, intuitive mind and using his skeptical, logical mind, how often would he use his instinctive mind and how often would he use his skeptical mind? Well, suppose Peter were to sway towards Stan's skeptical mode of living. He'll find himself in long discussions about topics like the true shape of the earth. From the evolutionary perspective of surviving and reproducing, nothing could be a greater waste of time and mental effort than figuring out the correct shape of the earth. Worse than this, it's not difficult to think of dozens of situations in which an uncritical, instinctive method of living is actively beneficial. Not least of which is the movements in the bushes example from earlier, but also gossip. Suppose Ian warns Peter against the character of Stan, accusing him of being a serial killer. From the evolutionary perspective of surviving and reproducing, what's Peter's best course of action? Is it to make friends with Stan to gather evidence for himself? Even if we assume that Ian's gossip is true only 10% of the time, why should Peter take this unnecessary risk and possibly end up dead when it costs him next to nothing to take Ian's word as true and exclude Stan from the tribe? By contrast, how often do you think a caveman would need to assess the validity of a logical argument or conduct an experiment? Probably not very often. Evolution thus favoured people who default to trusting their instincts and intuition over applying scepticism and logical thought, and we can therefore say that discovering the true shape of the earth was difficult not only because our senses are limited and mislead our intuition, but also because thinking sceptically, doubting our intuition and current beliefs, is difficult because we literally evolved not to do it. Most of the time. A quick point of clarification needs to be addressed. You may be thinking that asking questions about what would have increased the survival and reproduction probability of cavemen who lived 10,000 years ago is a waste of time because, well, we don't live 10,000 years ago. Sure, an instinctive, uncritical method of living may have been beneficial thousands of years ago, but we now live in an age where success in life seems to be heavily correlated to careful analysis, skepticism, and logical thought. I mean, Elon Musk didn't launch an electric car into space by reading gossip magazines. Surely, by now, evolution should have iterated our minds to heavily favour logic and critical thinking. Well, no. For one thing, we can look to the work of psychologists like Daniel Kahneman, whose research shows beyond all doubts that we still think like cavemen. However, to really understand this phenomenon, the key realisation is that modern day humans are the result of 4 billion years of slow evolutionary change. Until just 10,000 years ago, people were living as hunter-gatherers, or well, cavemen. Evolutionarily speaking, 10,000 years is simply not long enough for any meaningful changes to have occurred. This means that anatomically and psychologically, modern humans are effectively cavemen. I personally like to call this realization the caveman complex. The explanatory power of this realization is absolutely ridiculous. For one of many examples, it explains why children are afraid of the dark. In fact, many scientists believe this realization to be the fundamental realization, the central axiom of all psychology. And there's even an entire branch of the subject dedicated to its study, which is inventively called evolutionary psychology. Put more simply, the same way 10,000 years isn't enough time for evolution to have significantly changed our bodies, it's also not enough time to have significantly changed our minds and the same obstacles which prevented people from discovering the true shape of the Earth thousands of years ago still apply to us just as much today when researching quantum physics as they did 10,000 years ago when people thought the Earth was flat. With these obstacles in mind, it's nothing short of amazing that we ever figured out the true shape of the Earth, yet alone landed men on the moon. Think about the most important scientific concept at the heart of space travel, Newton's law of universal gravitation. The exact details of this equation are less important than its fundamental prediction. This equation tells us that there is a force of gravitational attraction between every two objects in the universe. Or, put more simply, at this very moment, there is a gravitational pull between this apple and this lemon. In all your years of observing fruit, have you ever been given reason to suspect that there is a gravitational pull between apples and lemons? It took the ineffable genius of Sir Isaac Newton to overrule his instinctive impression and look deeper than his intuition. 
Arguably all of the most revered scientific discoveries throughout history have followed this common trend of overruling intuition to find deeper truths. Think of Einstein's theory of special relativity, which predicts that time itself literally moves at different rates for observers in different relative frames. Or even more, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which predicts the bending of space itself. With this trend in mind, it doesn't seem unreasonable to think that some or all of the current mysteries of the universe may require some overruling of intuition, which will be difficult because our outdated cavemen brains hate it. For example, a mystery at the heart of modern physics is, what exactly caused the Big Bang? And, well, then, what caused that? And what caused that? All the way back until we ask what was the very first cause? Cause zero, if you like. And, well, what exactly was that? What if this question doesn't make sense because the concept of a first cause is fundamentally nonsensical? Our intuition certainly doesn't like this idea. But then again, as we've learned, our intuition doesn't think that apples and lemons are gravitationally attracted to each other. What if the chain of cause and effect somehow extends back infinitely? The same way we very naturally think of the chain of cause and effect extending forwards infinitely. In this light, asking what was the first cause becomes as nonsensical as asking what will be the last effect. There never will be one. Well, probably. We don't actually know. It's the proposition which makes sense to our intuition. But, yeah, that doesn't really count for anything. That's the point. We have no idea until better evidence comes along. At the risk of overstressing the point, if we take one more step back, we can notice that the same obstacles which make it difficult for us to discover scientific truths also make it difficult for us to discover, well, just about anything. And we can see that the trend of genius being linked to overruling intuition to find deeper truths runs far deeper than just science. To take just one of many, many examples, the most celebrated moves in chess are often sacrifices, and in particular, queen sacrifices. In most positions, sacrificing one's queen isn't a good idea. So, when a player evaluates a position, very rarely is their first thought to sacrifice their queen. For most people anyway. In other words, queen sacrifices are counterintuitive. Therefore, when a player finds a winning combination which requires a queen sacrifice, they've usually needed to look a lot deeper than the intuitively obvious moves. And sometimes, a lot, lot deeper. In summary, we are in a very real sense, cavemen who walked on the moon. We did this not by looking to confirm our instincts and current beliefs, but rather through the formalized system of never-ending self-doubt, known as the scientific method, which holds, at its core, the honest admission that what we think we know, maybe, and often probably is, wrong. As Yuval Noah Harari says beautifully and simply, the greatest scientific discovery was the discovery of ignorance. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Please do consider doing the usual like and subscribe if you've enjoyed the video. And please leave a comment if you have a suggestion or a question. Right now I can hear the skeptical stands among you throwing things at your screen in disgust because I've banged on about how misleading our intuition can be and the importance of demanding evidence, then given you next to no supporting evidence to back up any claims I've made throughout the video. The irony is almost overwhelming. To which I would say, you are absolutely right. You shouldn't accept what I'm saying without demanding evidence just because it makes intuitive sense. That's the whole point of this video. To which I would refer you to the book mentioned in the video, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and more specifically the studies referenced in the book. Now time for a shameless personal plug, which I promise I'll make quick. I would love to make more of these videos. So if you are going to purchase the book mentioned and you would like to support me to make more videos like this, please consider buying it through my Amazon affiliate link, which you can find in the description. Or if you'd like the audiobook version for free, all you need to do is make an Audible account using my affiliate link. Again, link in the description. Amazon will pay me a small fee for each sale at no extra cost to you.